Welcome to this panel where we're going to discuss the role of middle powers uh, in a multipolar world. My name is Cecilia Malmström. I have the huge honor to be moderating this stellar panel. Uh, and we will, well, without further ado, I think we, we will start. Uh, today in the world, and we've just reading the papers and listening to the seminars here, of course, we see increasing fragmentations, the big uh, competition between the superpowers, the emerge of new groupings, new um, alternative organizations, the role of middle powers seems to be growing. The world is facing enormous common challenges, climate, health, inequalities, um, security-wise, but yet, even if we do no, need more than ever global cooperation, international organizations are weaker than in decades. And this paradox is, of course, very, very sad. Uh, but how can we find a way forward? <laughs> if this competition between the, the big superpowers is, um, is increasing, can middle powers play a role? Can they act to strengthen multilateralism and to find new tools uh, forward to address the common challenges that we have. This is what we will discuss in this panel uh, with excellent uh, members with, uh, from all corners <coughs> of the world. And uh, if, if there's time, we'll have uh, some questions from the audience as well. I wanted to uh, start with you, Professor Allison. Uh, we talk about multipolar world or a bipolar world and middle powers. What is this? Are, is, is this a correct description of the world? Are there any definitions? What is a middle power? So, good question. And I think that uh, if I make an academic point briefly to start with, that I think the fact that we use such uh, simplistic terms uh, that cover so much actually complexity in the reality leaves us often talking at, at a fairly vague level. So there are a hundred or a thousand dimensions of power. And to try to, what multi essentially emphasizes is it's not uni and it's not bi. So there was a so-called bipolar world in 40 years after World War II in the Cold War. Uh, that collapsed with the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War uh, in what was called a unipolar uh, 1990s in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, and now, as that's eroded, uh, multi has become the kind of the, the phrase. But I think we should always remind ourselves it's way more complicated than that. And this is almost a reflection of the conceptual or theoretical poverty of most of our international relations conversation. I make just one more point. I think there is something real about the, the desire for at least not uni and not bipolar. Okay, so we need something if I just have to choose multiple joys. And I think, uh, in to try to put it in a historical perspective, we should remember three numbers, 50 or a half, a 25 or a quarter, and a seventh. Okay, and if you know the question as to which those are the answers, you've got a picture about what's happened in the last 75 years, okay? So a 50 or a half is U.S. share of global GDP end of World War II. Mm. Most of the world had been collapsed, okay? A quarter is U.S. share of GDP at the end of the Cold War. And a seventh is today. That's in purchasing power parity. If you do manufacturing, a half, a quarter, a seventh. You do trade, roughly similar. So what's happened is a diffusion of power globally, and then for the ones that are sort of bigger lumps, we call them middle, okay, mm -hmm. for the time being, but there are no specific criteria. And I think the, the, the result of it is the feeling that, well, wait a minute, it appears that nobody's in charge, which answers, excuse me, welcome to the real world. <laughs> Nobody is in charge. So there are many separate independent actors who without permission uh, and without fearing consequences of their action, decide if they're Saudi Arabia, we'd like to establish relations with Iran. Mm. They didn't ask permission. Mm. Or if we're individuals even. So nobody gave Elon Musk permission to, to put up Starlink or uh, Sam to 
have GPT 3.5. So even individuals at the level. So the sense that there's a lot of a, a lot more independent activity that's having a big impact on all of us is certainly right. And that then just defines the problem that you said, which is how do are the institutions that we have fit for service? Absolutely not. No. And then what kind of new institutions or new arrangements or others can be made to deal with the problems as they come up, whether they're war in Ukraine or whether they're Gaza or whether they're AI or whether they're economic development or whether they're COVID? Mm. Well, if nobody is in charge, it could mean that everybody is in charge uh, in a way. And it could also be, instead of lamenting, we could see there might be possibilities for, for other actors to step forward and to take responsibility. Minister Hassan, you're Deputy Prime Minister of Ethiopia and Foreign Minister. Thank you for being here. Uh, how, how do you see this from your horizon, uh, from Ethiopia and from the African uh, perspective? What role can, can Africa and Ethiopia play in this multipolar world? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here uh, in this uh, really a prestigious uh, gathering and platform. Uh, the contemporary world is emerging. Uh, the global uh, geopolitical competitions and the whole dynam dynamisms leads to uh, different multiple actors. For that, the middle powers uh, development and middle powers engagement is really becoming a reality. Uh, in this regard, when you look at uh, about the, the powers, we can look at from security perspective, uh, from economic perspective, and from digital uh, capability perspective. So uh, the multiple actors today, some of them may uh, have strong capacity in security areas and others in um, economy and others also on digital capability and the like. In this regard, today, Africa is a rising continent Absolutely. with a huge potential mm -hmm. and there are also emerging economies uh, in Africa. As within the South-South cooperation, the involvement of this dynamism, the emergence of middle powers and the multiple actors Africa has to play its proper role uh, in the upcoming times. For that, technology capability and uh, economic <coughs> development is very crucial. And the contemporary world invites for such kind of uh, dynamisms, and Africa has to be ready enough to compete in this uh, uh, landscape. And do you think Africa and is ready? I think there are different challenges. In Africa, uh, the challenge induced from climate change uh, uh, sources, uh, underdevelopment, technological capability problems, skill development, and others, debt burdens, and others. Given all these uh, challenges, there are promising and emerging uh, economies in Africa also. Uh, so I think. Uh, comparing to the previous time, now the continent is rising. Some countries are evolving and able to compete in this uh, global landscape. We'll come back to that in, in a moment. Minister yeah, Ed Stadler, you are um, Minister for European Union and Constitution in Austria. And Austria is also a member of the European Union. And European Union is, in a way, a big power. Um, but not if you compare to US and China, maybe in economy, but not politically. And also from Austria. Austria is a, is a small country, but a co country with a long tradition of uh, being neutral and having a strong international engagement. H how do you see this new world and the challenges? And what, what role could Austria and the European Union play? First of all, I would say Austria is not a small country. Austria is a middle-sized country. Yes. <laughs> Coming from Sweden, we were yeah. really big, and I call myself also a small country. But yes, you're right. Compared Point to the countries to. in Europe, yes. if we compare to Russia, Indonesia, or yes. India, of course, we are a small country, and, and we know it quite well. But I, I used to, to say we're a middle-sized country. And I Sorry. think <laughs> we are a, a country with a very long tradition, as you mentioned, mm. um, when it comes to being a neutral ground. 
um, when it comes to be a seat of the United Nations. And this is uh, something which is also important, and especially in times where we uh, see a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us, where we see that we can solve these problems only together, mm. not one by one. And where we also see that there is the need not taking the, the moral high ground and uh, raising the finger and tipping on others, but discussing and ne negotiating things on the, on the same height, um, then we also have to engage with middle powers, whatever middle powers are. And I'm very grateful for uh, the explanation of you, Professor, because um, I was also wondering, is there a definition of middle powers? And if not, then I would say Austria could also be a middle power. A middle power as a bridge builder for, you know, within the European Union to the Eastern countries. We did it in the past, um, but also regarding for example, Turkey, at a, at a certain moment, uh, Turkey is a very important partner when it comes to illegal migration, uh, when it comes to also the situation in, in Ukraine, and they tried um, also to negotiate, and they were successful, for example, with the Sea Grain Initiative. So, Austria could play a certain important role within the European Union, sized in the middle of Europe, um, middle-sized country, and being a neutral ground also. Mm, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to no, offend no, it you. Wasn't I, an, I didn't mean it as an offense. Country. <laughs> One country that is definitely not small is Indonesia. Uh, and and um, you, Mr. Jadial, you've been in government, but you're now head of a, a think tank, a founder and chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, <laughs> where you work with different projects um, on democracy and, and on, on sort of the, the citizenship, active citizenship. Indonesia is obviously a huge country, but still a middle power, if we can define it. What role could Indonesia play when it comes to sort of being a little bit balancing between the, the global south and the global north? Okay, well, first, let me make the, the big point that I think in the 21st century, the world order will be shaped not by the great powers no. or major powers, but by the proliferation of middle powers. I think what is significant in this century is that there are more middle powers in all the regions of the world than ever before. And each of these middle powers have the size, have the ambition, have the resourcefulness to play a greater role. And, I think, and, and what is interesting, a lot more of these middle powers are establishing relations among one, one another. Uh, so, so that's on, on, on a global context. Uh, responding to your question, Cecilia, uh, I think what is interesting is that uh, middle powers uh, are playing a very significant role in the defining the regional architecture. Mm -hmm. Now, I refer to Indonesia uh, and, and ASEAN. Yeah? If you look at the regional order that's taking place uh, in, in Southeast Asia, do you think that's shaped by the United States? No. Yeah, uh, all the elements of the regional architecture, the Treaty of Amity of Cooperation, ASEAN Charter, ASEAN Declaration, uh, the East Asia Summit, and it's initiated by a local regional uh, country, which is Indonesia, and also with Vietnam and, and all the others, right? But I think that is a very unique uh, feature of uh, middle powerhood, uh, is that they can fill space and create architecture that major powers can't do uh, within that region. And I think also one very interesting uh, phenomenon that we are seeing at the moment uh, is that uh, you know, uh, we are trying to define uh, middle powers. I would at least point to dichotomy of two categories. One is the middle powers of the global north uh, that belongs to the west. Yeah. Austria, Canada, Australia, Korea, uh, Japan, right? They have uh, treaty alliances uh, with the West and so on. And the global, global uh, sorry, middle powers of the global south, right? India, Indonesia, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, Argentina, and, and so on. And I think what is interesting and not seen much in the news is the emerging alignments and relationships and content, diplomatic and economic contents that are being established by the middle powers of the global south, mm. right, uh, and those in the uh, western uh, uh, countries. I mean, in Asia alone, Indonesia and Korea, two middle powers are really doing a lot now yes. to shape regional relations. And Australia and India, two middle powers from both global south and, and the west, are also doing a lot significantly to elevate 
that relationship. And we're going to continue to see this trend. And as I said again, it's not being monitored enough by, 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 by the conventional media, but it is a hugely significant geopolitical development. Maybe that's a good thing that is not monitored by media because it can allow different initiatives to grow a little bit and finding your way forward. Yeah, Professor Ali. Yeah. So just to pick up on what uh, my Indonesian friend said, I think that's absolutely right. But again, apologize, but it's more complicated, okay. So in some, if you think of different uh, dimensions of order, uh, uh, for example, the international security order in Southeast Asia or in the Western Pacific is largely defined by a U.S. military presence that has been there since the Battle of Midway. And the way you can tell how significant that is in creating the order is imagine it's withdrawn and now look at the politics. Similarly, the order in Europe that for Austria, the international security order is essentially defined by NATO, mm. but NATO is basically a U.S. military backbone and some other components. Okay? Uh, and again, to try to see how important is that, imagine that was withdrawn. And I would bet, for example, if that were withdrawn, you would, I would wish you would see a European uh, superpower. I would sure. like to. But I would bet you would see a renationalization of militaries with much more stress among the parties. So that's why I think that we have to take it in different domains. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the energy business, in the, let's take, for example, oil. Saudi Arabia, which if there were no energy, if there were no oil, Saudi Arabia would, I mean, pejoratively, would be a sandbox. Okay? Who would be interested? Okay? But oil being what it is in the, in the global economy, in the, in the dimension of energy, Saudi Arabia and even the other suppliers are big, are big players. In the population world, I think, again, when you see a large population, as the governments are, are harnessing or providing the, uh, enabling their citizens to, to build their own economies, they become bigger. If they have a bigger GDP, lo and behold, that tr translates into power in other domains. We look at the AI discussion going on, there's basically only two countries that have advanced AI, the U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. So everybody else can talk about it, and the Europeans can regulate it, uh, but uh, can regulate what they, or try to regulate what they want to regulate. But where's anybody there inventing anything? The answer is there's not. Okay? Now, I wish there were. Uh, there's a lot of extremely capable. Um, so I don't like the fact that there's just two. Okay? And I think the Europeans, I, I imagine, will become part of the. So I think it just, if we took different, different slices of the dimension, you would find the relative power of the parties. But where you see everywhere is uh, that Indonesia, or, or take, take uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia did not ask permission from the US or from maybe even your African Union colleagues if you're going to join the BRICS. You think about it, you think, what's good for us? We can act, we can, we can act. Okay. Uh, hmm. This is a slightly different world because uh, you would, if, if every independent actor can do, can, the Houthis, the Houthis are interrupting global trade routes. I mean, this is 50,000 guys running around with a, you know, a few uh, missiles and a few drones. Can interrupt the global, say, my God, there's too many actors in too many different dimensions, uh, and nobody's again telling them, no, this, we have rules. Here's the rules. Here's the order. That's good. Stop. Uh, now, in fact, uh, an effort is being mounted, and fortunately a multilateral effort, and I think it'll be successful. But I think if we take, take international security, the piece that I look at the most of the time, but if you look at the international money, and the money markets or, or uh, currencies, again, you'll only find two or three that end up being playing the reserves or playing the role of uh, the currencies for trade. Uh, if you look at trade, uh, if you look at China, 
that's a huge factor. And the fact that the things have been changing so rapidly lately, I think means that it all seems even more confusing, which it, which it is. Yeah. There were a lot of issues there. Yeah. Uh, let, let's um, come back on, on a few of them. Uh, Minister, Ethiopia has a very important role in Africa. You are the seat of the African Union in Addis Ababa, uh, and the, the African Commission sits there. And you also recently, as a country, joined uh, BRICS. BRICS. Yes, uh, uh, as Professor alluded to. So, so th that gives you a lot of, of clout uh, as a country, both on the continent, but, but also uh, as a country. How do you see that? What, what, what role can you use these two organizations for to sort of advance global and international cooperation as well? Or is it no. mainly regional and, and intercontinental? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's true. Ethiopia is the founding member of the United Nations mm -hmm. and the founding member of uh, African Union, OAU, African Union, and the leading, one of the leading country for the establishment of the African Union. And again, the host, we are proud of that. Um, and again, currently, we joined the BRICS. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also uh, very happy uh, to be one of the uh, pivotal players in the BRICS community. BRICS uh, is a really emerging platform. Look, the global landscape, the challenge, the competitions, and a lot of problems. And the global setup is not uh, that much responsive to the developing countries, especially for underdeveloped countries and for emerging economies. In this regard, I think the <coughs> establishment of BRICS is a good opportunity to strengthen multilateralism uh, and again to have more uh, opportunities for partnership on economic development and related areas. Uh, I think BRICS is not a, a, a new setup uh, just by uh, shifting from one block to another block. Instead, it's a new initiative and a new establishment to create more access for partnership and to strengthen uh, multilateralism. In this regard, Ethiopia, as we're as we are managing emerging economy with huge demand, I think it is a good opportunity, additional opportunity, to have more uh, partnership and more access for economic cooperation and the like. This is very uh, important. Again, the African Union is addressing different issues. Uh, for that, beyond the continent, it, Africa has to play a pivotal role across the globe for multilateralism and in the international arena on trade, on investment, on other economic activities. So this setup is really a good opportunity within these challenging times and platforms. Mm -hmm. Minister Ed Stattler, um, European Union likes to operate in a world where there are rules and norms and some sort of predictability and all that is falling apart now uh, to a large extent. What, what new tools do you see? Uh, can, can there be new alliances, yeah. new kind of corporations? Well, what's the way forward on a short-term basis but also a little longer? Well, I would like to come back to what Professor Ellis yes, al please. already mm -hmm. said um, because I think it's uh, the need now for Europe to really become a superpower to become a power in the world, to be seen as a geopolitical power. And this is, of course, not easy. You know it better uh, than me, um, having been a member of the European Commission, and also you, Cecilia, that it is a very complex thing, the European Union. By now, we are 27 uh, member states, and we are not the United States. Uh, and we don't want to be United States. But in a world uh, like we face now, we have to hold together. And I think we already showed that we, that we can show strength, um, especially if I'm thinking uh, of uh, the sanctions uh, after the Russian aggression on Ukraine. They were all decided unanimously. Mm. And this also showed the real strength of the European Union. 27 member states, and it was not easy because everyone has other interests and everyone comes from another geopolitical point, political point, historical point, but in the end, there were 12 sanction packages, uh, and, and this, is, this is the good thing. The bad thing is that we lost the battle of the narrative, because uh, large parts of the world and also 
many, many Europeans say that the high prices um, are there because of the sanctions, forgetting that they are there because of the Russian aggression. And this was only the, the reaction. And of course, the sanctions are hitting Russia, but of course, also partly Europe. But this is the price we have to pay. So what do I think what we do uh, need to do in the next um, five years, maybe, if we take the next um, time of the new commission, then I think we have to develop a strength together. We have to care for the big things. We have to negotiate with other superpowers and middle powers. We have to find ways to cooperate more closely. And I think in this regard, it is also good that we resumed uh, the negotiations with India for a free trade agreement. We see BRICS. BRICS is, is expanding. BRICS is getting stronger. So we should not fall behind. If this is the case, uh, we are losing. Uh, and, and this is really something we have to do urgently. And I myself have to say, I was born at the beginning of the 80s. I'm a child of peace. I'm a child of prosperity. I never thought that I have to sit on a panel and discussing about a war in the middle of Europe. Now we have to threat from outside. Now we really should use the opportunity to hold together. <laughs> So Europe, I was in another panel, uh, I was listening to panelists say Europe is a superpower and maybe it's getting superpowers uh, as well, uh, but we're not there no. yet. But if I make just one footnote point to this point, just the, the, uh, uh, where the Europeans work, act, are capable of acting together, they have superpower. So and in superpowers. economic relations with the US, when the European Union decided that GE, when it was one of the great American companies, couldn't conduct a merger. That was a merger for the US, for GE, between two companies. The European Union said, no, this is contrary to our anti-monopoly understanding, and the merger didn't happen. Mm. So I think it's a, the, there's the latent power of the 27 members of the, EU, of the EU and you're expanding. We want to grow yeah. up to 33 it plus. Is, it is in principle, if you add it all up, mm -hmm. if we're all acting in some more or less uniform fashion, actually does end up having superpower. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Yes. Sorry. I wanted uh, to ask you as well. Please. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I define superpower as a country that can project its military force anywhere in the world. Right? And that is the United States. And so far, there's only one superpower. I don't think Europe wants to be that. And I don't think I want Europe to be uh, that. And uh, you know, I think we talk about middle power. There, there are two or three class classifications in my view. Uh, one is just a normal middle power, not, not major, not small, but have enough size and have e enough economy to be counted and population as um, a middle power. Another one is uh, an active one, mm. right? Uh, so punching above its weight. And the third one is a pivotal middle power, right? Uh, India is really having a strong ambition to lead the global south, right? And showing that during the last presidency of uh, the G20. I would hope that Europe's ambition is not to become a superpower, uh, but to become a pivotal uh, middle power. A superpower in which regard, we can ask? <laughs> Uh, as I said, the definition was a country that can project its force anywhere in the world. That is the textbook uh, de definition. And so far, that's only the United States at the moment. Yeah. I meant it, that the European Union should become a superpower economically. Okay. I think we are already a superpower when it comes to values. And, and we have to, uh, to stop our um, foreign policy with uh, the raised finger because there was uh, the Indian foreign minister, for example, who said recently that Europe should grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the, uh, um, the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. And that is what, what I mean. We, we should see also the others. There was uh, somehow a starting point also during the very uh, hard pandemic uh, phase uh, in Europe. First, they said, okay, we got all vaccines because we could afford to buy them. But then we were the only power, let's put it like that, in the world who cared also for other regions. For example, for the Western Balkan countries, also for the countries of uh, North, uh, Africa, the North African countries. And, and this is what I think can also define a superpower, care for others, but be stable in, in your values and show that you are a geopolitical player in the world. And I think this is what we have to develop in Europe. I think uh, to define middle power and the like, 
might have some academic uh, perspective and standard. For me, as I mentioned before, the military capability, uh, economic uh, power and digital power together will lead to that uh, comprehensive capability and position. In this regard, I think there are multiple actors. Those who are able to really uh, achieve these three fundamentals together will lead to that uh, power levels. I think we are optimists. In the upcoming times, Africa would be a pivotal uh, power force in the globe. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Jalal, I wanted to ask you as well, we talked about different alliances being formed, some a little bit under the radar, some are still in, in, in an emerging uh, stage. Is there not a risk that with all these regional organizations and, and, and new corporations that it contributes to more fragmentation of the world and not to some sort of common agenda where we actually address the problems that, that every country, big or small, wherever, north or south, uh, are, are facing with climate and, and poverty and inequality, security issues? How, how do you see that sort of tension? Well, you know, uh, multilateralism is sick now, right? It's, it's in a, sorry, it's in ill condition, it's in bad shape, right? Uh, because of the Ukraine war and, and all the other things. So a lot of countries, uh, including middle powers, are thinking, look, if the multilateral process or pathway is not promising, maybe a more promising path is uh, these things that we are creating with fellow middle powers and countries of, of the region. Indonesia, for example, uh, we, uh, we are a member of ASEAN. Uh, we are uh, a non-aligned country, uh, and uh, we, we are a member of uh, IORA. I mean, so many different uh, organizations, and we're establishing a different relationship with different uh, middle powers. It doesn't make the world more fragmented, but I think it adds more uh, more content uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 the world order uh, in 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 our view. Yeah, uh, put it this way: I think the more middle powers uh, def uh, are less attached to to great powers. Uh, in my view, uh, the the texture of world affairs will become will become better. Uh, if it's as rigid as during the Cold War, the bipolar uh, order. Uh, I think that's not good. Uh, that's not good for the world. But uh, I see how uh, you know Australia, a member of Western Alliance, uh, conducts itself, a uh, close relationship with uh, Indonesia, with India, and so on. That that changes uh, the uh, the condition of geopolitical rivalry that we are uh, experiencing at the moment. Yeah. I, I ask the minister a question. So, I think as a way of helping us understand the middle power conversation. Could you say just a word about the deliberations in your country about joining BRIC, and what, why do I why do I do this? Whether I mean, the, what, what's the advantage for my becoming a? Tell us what the what's the what was the considerations? Yes. Yeah, uh, joining BRICS from our. Uh, point of view, it's uh, a good opportunity, a good opportunity to have uh, more uh, global <coughs> partners and more emerging uh, platform for that. You know, for uh, Ethiopia, currently managing emerging economies with different challenges debt burdens, um, other technological capability challenges and others. We need more partners and we need more effective and strong multilateral partnership and that BRICS would create a good opportunity even for bilateral engagements with uh, other uh, developed countries and to strengthen South-South cooperation. Currently, we are not satisfied and happy with the existing institutions like the World Bank and IMF response today. Our economy is demanding and the challenges are a lot. In this regard, 
having such additional opportunity is really very timely and important to uh, increase our uh, engagement and to address our outstanding problems. These are the rationals behind to join the BRICS. We have really measured expectation from BRICS and we are also committed to play a strong and positive role to be as expected and as planned to address such outstanding challenge for developing countries. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is a question, oh, oh there was a, yes. Uh, there's a microphone there. We have time for a, a couple. Start with you. Thank you so, so yes, it's thank on. you so much. I just wanted to follow up with Professor Allison's question. You highlighted the benefits or potential benefits from joining the BRICS. Have you considered any potential costs uh, or unexpected consequences from the decision that you might be able to share with us? Thank you. We evaluated and we uh, looked at different scenarios, the pros and the cons, but joining BRICS today is really a timely and a good opportunity. We're talking about partnership. We are talking about economic uh, partnership and engagement. In this regard, if we move forward as planned and based on the vision and roadmap of the BRICS, that is a good opportunity and we are committed to move in that way and to exploit that platform potential and uh, again to play our side also to be as a good membership and a good partner in that platform. It's a good opportunity. Thank you very much. We have one question there and then there and then we'll have two. Thank you. I'm Danny Kwa from Hi, the Danny. Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. We've talked about what potentially middle powers can do. Can I ask the panel if they have a vision about why we want middle powers to play a role. <laughs> do we think middle powers will do a better job than the great powers? Is there unanimity about what we're trying to achieve? Is it just bragging rights so that we can say <laughs> our part of the world is now a superpower? Why do we want middle powers to play a role? <laughs> Coming from Singapore, an important middle power. Uh, yes. <laughs> Anybody okay, want I, to jump on that? Can I yes, take that? Uh, Danny, as, as you know, uh, we're both from Southeast Asia. <laughs> and, uh, you know, middle power can be uh, one of the solution providers for problems of, of the region and of the world. You look at our region, uh, many of the conflicts uh, are resolved among themselves or by middle power, but not by a superpower. For example, uh, in the Cambodian conflict, it was Indonesia, right, uh, working with France. Uh, now there's a, a negotiation for code of conduct in the South China Sea. The only game in town on the South China Sea, who is it? It's between China and the uh, ASEAN countries, including Indonesia. Uh, Sabah and, Philipp uh, sorry, Philippine and Malaysia over Sabah, they had a dispute, huge dispute. It was dropped, not because of China or the United States, but uh, because of uh, their own uh, uh, efforts. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we're dealing with Rohingya, and as you know, ASEAN is taking that role. So my point is there are a lot of uh, occasions where in fact superpower or major power follows the lead of middle power, right, as uh, I have mentioned. Uh, so we, we can, uh, what do you call it, uh, become a solution uh, provider and believe it or not, we can develop our own sense of except exceptionalism. You know, before we thought it was just American exceptionalism, but you talk to the Chinese, you talk to the Indian, even the Indonesian and Brazilian, they're developing their own sense of uh, accept uh, yeah. Okay, uh, one quick question there. Thank you, Feb it is Thank you Febrian from Indonesia. We're living in a world. He's our ambassador in the, okay. in the UN. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to just. your fan club with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a question. We, we, we're living yeah. in a world where uh, all of the world system, based on the thing that we inherited from the world war, too. Uh, barely we see any revitalization on the global governance. So putting this in mind, so what do you think the middle power can do in democratizing and revitalizing the multilateral system? You know, 
in many countries, mm -hmm. democratization start by the middle uh, uh, class. So I want to put this, the middle uh, power within the context of the uh, global governance. How yeah. the, more, the, 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 the middle power can play a role? Because if we see middle, <coughs> middle power is not yet taken up this job. Do you think we should take it up or not? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And, and let me feel it, for the, because even if we see different initiatives coming and merging and, and cooperation booming in, in, in a positive way, we still need some global rules, right? And that's why we had a multilateral system, because if we don't have, in the end, it will be the small and middle powers losing. Uh, so how can we, building on the question also by the Ambassador and with the final words here, if you could quickly just give a few comments on that. H how can the middle power and the different emerging corporations um, contribute to stabilizing or modernizing the global rules as well? So if I make two points. System. First point, I think is a great question. So the default from the international order that was created after World War II that's basically provided seven, 78 years without any great power war and greater improvements in lives of people around the world than ever before. The default from that is the jungle. Yeah, exactly. The normal condition is the jungle. Mm. So the struggle to figure out, uh, given that the objective conditions for the uh, essentially a US-led international order no longer exist, the need, the, and we don't want the default to become the jungle, Therefore, what? It means that those that have any power to do anything need to be doing it. And if I make one second point from the Lee Kuan Yew thing. Lee Kuan Yew was always a wonderful example that uh, for great intellectual power, you don't need a license. For, for offering great ideas about uh, the strategic conditions of the world and what to do about them, mm. you just... Stand up and, and offer an idea. So that's true for all the all the countries, and all all countries. A little thing, a small country like like Singapore, could have a giant of a intellectual contributor to helping us understand the strategic order. Thank you. Very short answer from a European perspective. I would say we should engage with them, and we try, should try to put our shoes in their shoes to understand each other and to, and to help and to show that, that our rules-based world is really something we built up in the last decades and which is working, which does not mean that we raise the finger and say, you have to do it like that, but engaging and try to understand each other. Can I, a quick yes, one? Yes, please, all of you. Uh, I think, I hope I'm wrong on this, but my observation is that much of the global south is losing faith in the liberal international order, right? And what happened in, in the Middle East, in Gaza, uh, reinforce that point. The problem is this. The Global South, not comfortable with the uh, world order, they want to change it, but they don't have an idea, an answer on how, what is the, the, the new model that should replace that liberal international order. If you ask 100 countries in the Global South, what is their uh, prescription? Majority would say, I don't know, except India has one prescription, which is India must join the UN Security Council, and China is definitely going to shoot that down. And, and the others, Why not Africa? Uh, <laughs> and Africa also, right, <laughs> yes. So, so uh, I think uh, th the fact that uh, we're not happy with the global order, but uh, we don't have a clear answer on how the new global order uh, should be like. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's the challenge. Mm. Minister, you have the last. Thank you. The international order has to be fair and reasonable. We don't want to see unipolar, and we don't want to see and encourage this uh, rivalries. Instead, multiple actors who are able to look and address the structural problem of the world, especially the poor societies, underdeveloped countries, is really a very timely and important uh, time for that, the involvement of multiple actors and the creation of this reasonable and fair globe to be very crucial. And instead of looking for one or two or around that players in the globe, that's the, the really the concern of Africa and underdeveloped countries will look 
for more strong and multiple players to hear the voice of different deprived societies and communities. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we have had uh, heard different ideas, different initiatives, different ambitions. Uh, exactly where this will land when it comes to, to new global rules will be a seminar for next year, I think. So we'll be back. <laughs> thank, thank you, and join me in thanking this fantastic panel.